welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast that explores the arts and cultural production. I'm Paula Blair and as promised or threatened a couple of years ago, in this episode, Andrew Sheil and I return to Ready Player One, this time focusing on the adaptation from novel to film. Huge thanks to our members at patreon.com forward slash avcultures for your continued support. All memberships currently grant early access to new episodes and money received is chipping away at the costs we've incurred in making the show so far. If you like the show but can't contribute financially, shares and links on social media are a really great help. If anyone's interested in chatting for the podcast or just in private because there's a pandemic on, there'll be further contact details at the end. Until then, here's a lot more nerdery from me and Sheil. This may be one of our geekiest nerd offs yet. Yeah, I, I'm struggling to think of anything that can compete with it, and yet I'm also struggling to overcome a vague sense of disappointment, which is probably the I've read the book, there were so many cool things in the book, they didn't do those things in the film sense of disappointment, rather than thinking that the film is bad in any way on a second viewing. In fact, I noticed a lot more on a second viewing. There's a whole podcast series that we could do, which would be the difference between a first viewing and a second viewing. This was one of those, it was quite significantly different films. Yeah. We saw it, what, it was released back in the spring of 2018. This was one of the first podcasts we recorded, was Ready Player One, so Mm. we're retreading very old ground for us. I didn't listen back to it before this. I can't be bothered, (laughs) frankly. It's quite difficult to listen back to yourself. I think there's a lot of stuff that we dealt with back then, so we're not necessarily... There may be some repetition because we can't remember what we already said, but I think we're going to focus mostly on the adaptation, as you say, this time, because we have now just read the novel. And we haven't just just read the novel, have we? We have read its arse off, because (laughs) we have read it out loud to each other, taking turns, and even at one point reading it out to my offspring, too, who really got into the idea of sitting down for story time, even though they started halfway through, (laughs) so they had no idea what had happened. Well, you got them caught up quite heroically. You give a really good description of what had Mm. happened so far. But also it was nice for them because they're being brought up by parents who are very into the likes of Star Wars and Indiana Jones and Back to the Future. So they're very aware of the landscape of culture that is the backdrop to this. So they were recognising references and that was quite fun for them. Yes. So then, Dr Blair, what did we just both read and watch? We're looking again at Ready Player One. Which is a 2018 adaptation of a 2011 novel. And I gather that the rights for the novel, as is normal now, had already, the film rights had already been acquired, I think, not just before the novel was published, but simultaneously with the signing of the publication Mm. contract for the novel. This is becoming quite normal, but even if it wasn't normal, this is the kind of novel where that's what happens, Mm. isn't it? Yeah, this is an inevitability that this is going to be a movie because it's so loaded with movie and video game references, especially Mm. now. The distinction between films, cinema and video games is really quite blurred now more than ever. The headlines for this one are that when we watched the film the first time, we hadn't read the book. Hadn't even heard of it before. I just want to reference after reference after reference. It's all these tiny details that you don't notice, right? I'm taking us through to a moment where it swings past a little planet and it's barely legible there look ludus ludus um, oh right, yes okay. okay so the headline for this episode is that we have now read the novel we hadn't the first time and the differences between the novel and the film are just stunning vast, this yeah. is not recognizable as a plot from the book yeah but these are substantially different media with substantially different conventions. If you were to make a film version of the plot from the book, even with trimming here and there, you know, ditch a subplot here, even with that, it would still be a six, seven hour film. It's not just pared back, it's they just threw out the plot and kept the characters, Halliday's Find My Three Keys and Get an Easter Egg Challenge, and some of the dynamics between the characters, and that's about it. Mm. Well, they, you know, they kept the story space, but the plot is gone. So in the book, it goes using information held in Anorak's almanac. 
this book of rantings left by James Halliday. Find the first key. When you find the first key, you get another clue. Use that to find the first gate. Use the key to open the first gate. Do a challenge inside the first gate. If you succeed at the challenge, get another riddle. And then so on and so on through a second key, a second gate, a third key, and a third gate. And when you do all of that, you get the Easter egg. What that turns into in the film is mysterious unnamed past Gunter has revealed the specific challenge you need to do to get the first key. Finish that, you get a riddle that takes you to the second key. Finish that, you get a riddle that takes you to the third key. And at the third key takes you to a place where you have to play a computer game. And if you play that computer game right, you get the egg. So it's instantly shrunk down mm. to something much simpler. And also every single challenge, isn't it, in the book, it's all a single player thing. Whereas the first challenge that they do in the film is a massive race that loads of people are taking part in. Yeah. And it seems to be a timed event where it happens at a specific time maybe on a weekly basis or something and just hundreds maybe thousands of people are piling in to yeah. do this one race and figure out how to win it there's a massive difference there where in the book you turn up and it's this one player thing and any number of people can be doing it at the same time but it's really obscure and incredibly hidden and a lot of them are as does happen in the film when they because the final one is adventure a lot of them in the book are based on the very earliest of the games the way it works in the book is that in order to get the first key the copy key you have to first find a specific location on a specific planet that is a location that recreates a very obscure Dungeons and Dragons module called Tomb of Horrors and then using the original paperwork for the Dungeons and Dragons module you need to navigate your way through the Tomb of Horrors without getting killed by stuff and when you get to the center of it you then have to play the Tomb of Horrors boss at a late 70s mm. arcade game called Joust. This all mm. takes place, just to backtrack a little bit, because the significance of Ludus is that Wade Watts, who is Parzival, he is a high school student in the book. It's actually not clear what he does in the film. He just seems to play Oasis all the time. But he is at high school, and high schools are actually in the Oasis. There's a public school system inside the Oasis, and Ludus is a planet that is people going to high school. School. Yes, and hundreds of high schools. The first the clue that Halliday left on his deathbed, Ludus is the answer, that's the location. So that's actually where it starts, is that you have to actually just mm. find the location of the task to get the thing. <laughs> Yeah, so it's challenge after challenge after challenge, yeah. Find the Tomb of Horrors, find which planet it's on. Oh yeah, and we just noticed in the film that Ludus is very briefly featured in one shot. Because there's nothing else Mm. to do with that, that's all been stripped out of the book entirely. And just one character, Wade's bully, whose avatar is called Irock, is transferred into Irock, who helps the bad guys, who helps... IOI. So back to the (coughs) challenges. First challenge Dungeons and Dragons followed by the Atari game Joust and then you have to remember all of Matthew Broderick's lines from War Games in the gate which the key you get there opens. And then in the second one, to get the Jade Key, you need to do a text adventure game called Zork on a certain planet called Froboz, which involves just finding loads of things from around this house and restoring them to a treasure cabinet. When you've done that, use the key to open a gate. The gate is hidden in a Voigt Kampf machine in a Blade Runner recreation building. And inside that, you have to complete the arcade game Black Tiger, but in first-person shooter form. They've Mm. updated an arcade game into first-person shooter form, so it's an implicit suggestion as to what you could do with these old arcade games. Mm. And then the the third one, the crystal key, to find the crystal key, it's to do with using his knowledge of the Canadian rock band Rush. Yeah, it's all just to do with knowledge of the the sleeve notes on on one of their albums. And then what you do when you've got that key is you use it to open a gate, and inside that gate you then have to do three challenges, one of which is... He has to play the arcade game Tempest, which he's not very good at at all. It's a 1981 Atari arcade game. Then has to roleplay King Arthur and several other characters in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, just as he did with War Games. And then he has to play Adventure, but he doesn't have to win at Adventure, another Atari console game. He doesn't have to win at Adventure. He just has to recreate the bit in Adventure where you find the Easter egg, because Adventure was the first ever game where you found an Easter egg. 
Uh, yes. Is that one of the bits so, I fell asleep so during? So that's one of the very few bits in the book which actually gets the recreated same. in the song. Yeah. Yeah. This is long story short. The whole thing about the challenges in the book is that they involve investigating very early computer games, their progenitors, including Dungeons and Dragons and text adventure games, and in doing so, investigating various ways that gaming might conceivably have evolved if the way that computer gaming has evolved now hadn't happened. So these untaken paths of mm. the development of gaming that James Halliday was clearly aware of since he was there at the birth of modern mm. computer gaming. In the book, it's about not just knowing your history, but being aware of just how specific our current state of computer gaming is and how contingent it is, how differently things could have played out. But in the film, there's no Dungeons and Dragons. The only bit where there's actually playing an arcade game is in the third challenge. They, 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 the one thing that actually stays the same is they keep Adventure, mm. that console game, in the third challenge. And of course, because they're rolling in the film, they, they squish together the key and the thing you do in the gate that opens the key, they squish these together. So they play Adventure in order to get the third key, which instantly gets you mm. the egg if you've got all three keys. But apart from that, these challenges, they're not part of the extreme nostalgia of the book. So in the first of the three challenges, the copper key challenge is win a road race. And that's and of course, in order to do it, you have to figure out how to do something that seems to be impossible. And then the second one is enter a movie recreation. And it's movie recreation in a library that exists that's full of the movies that James Halliday watched. It just seems to be a thing already. You can enter the sets of movies. So enter a movie recreation and then find a recreation of Halliday's long lost love and save her from some zombies. And then the third one is play adventure, but don't play it to win, play it to find the Easter egg in adventure. You know, it's two thirds of the challenges in this are just changed to something completely different. They keep some elements such as Parzival, the main character, the avatar name of Wade Watts. He wins without knowing it, a coin, which later gives him an extra life. In the book, he wins it by playing a perfect game of Pac-Man on a planet which is entirely full of recreations of historical arcades. In the book, he does it just by offhandedly betting a non play a character, I bet you that's the only time that Halliday mentions this woman in all of his recordings of his memories, and he's right. So the non-player character gives him this coin, and it turns out that the non-player character is actually an avatar of a real person. So I think they keep some elements, but the big headline thing is this has changed significantly. But that's not to say, boo, movies change books, because in reality, it's not that anything has changed, it's that the film has copied the book, but only copied some few elements of it. And because of medium specificity, added a load of different elements and not copied a lot of elements too. So I can definitely see why, for example, the film doesn't take place over the course of about three years. It takes place over the course of, what, about two weeks, mm. the film? Because the book is, yeah, there's loads of searching for the first key and nobody can find it, and then there's this eureka moment. And then between the first key and the first door challenge, there's, I think, a year where a lot of people now know what the riddle is they have to solve to find the second key, but nobody has yet solved the riddle. So it's just, how much time is it going to take to solve the riddle? Well, it's about a year. Whereas in this, riddles are solved in a matter of minutes, aren't they? There's medium specificity stuff that goes, we can not just have a bit in this film that says one year later. And it's not just that you could do that and still adapt the book perfectly, it's that if you adapted the book spot on there, you'd have to have all this relationship drama happen in that year. There's a huge amount of relationship drama between Parzival and his briefly girlfriend fellow avatar Artemis that occurs within that year that's all really tense and fraught, isn't it? And involves lots of conflict. They put tiny elements of that into the characters doing some of the challenges in the film. You just couldn't have that much time devoted to human drama that's not taking the plot anywhere in a film version. That's my summary of why this film is not awful. There's one element that I thought was worthy of pointing out. In the book, when the characters finish the challenge that's behind the second door, the jade door, as a reward they get to pick one of a long roster of giant robots. You get a little tiny model of it and it goes in their inventory and of course they can just operate it at any point and fight as this enormous mechanical robot. 
in the book, they don't replicate the challenge in which the characters can pick a giant robot. So they don't do that. But they wanted to still have that moment where in the climactic battle outside Castle Anorak, they have robots going up against robots. And so they just had characters either buy those robots or make them themselves so that they had those things in their inventory and they could just use them in that final battle. So they did have Mecha Godzilla, but it was just something that the arch villain Nolan Sorrento just had acquired. Maybe he bought it to use for this big battle and they also had another giant robot to go up against it which was the robot from the iron giant but that was one that h one of the avatars had just been building herself rather than one that anyone won in a competition so huge amounts of changes and the, reading through the book knowing what the film looked like i found myself thinking if i was going to adapt this i just don't think i'd be creative enough to have made this many changes to try and get it into a cinematic format I would have been constantly slogging to go, oh, I really want to keep that bit in, I really want to keep that bit in. It seems that to adapt stuff these days, you have to be so okay with just going, right, we'll take out absolutely everything except the relationships between these characters and the basic characteristics of the story world and just start again from there. We'll have to rebuild this entire story from the ground up. I would be so precious about trying to get very specific elements of the original into film form. All in all, I've got to admire that creativity, that we're going to rebuild this from the ground up creativity. Were you loving it for any reason other than just reference, 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 when we watched it the second time? I enjoy just watching it because I think it's a fun film and it's quite surfacy in a way. Mm. There's not a huge amount of substance and I mean there's all this knowledge and research that's gone into all this specific area of culture and Mm. yet none of the people involved have ever seemed to have researched women in any way so I find (laughs) that quite fascinating. It's one of those movies that I find it's got loads of problems it's a story that's got loads of problems but I really enjoy it I don't know why I can't explain it I just think it clips along at a nice pace it's Spielbergian but it's of that Spielberg era I mean things that I think are useful to point out are I mean I think it's much more prominent in the book that all of these people are having to become obsessed with the obsessions of this one guy and in a way it's quite dictatorial where he's determining all the things they all think are cool and great and they have to reevaluate that at the end because I think it's clear in the film that he wants to hand it over to people who won't make what he considers to be the mistakes of his life whereas I don't feel that the holiday in the book version has quite come to that conclusion. Yeah one change that really struck me is that the holiday in the book wants people to love what he loved and that his personal lives and his personal regrets are not part of the knowledge you need to have in order to do the challenges. Although actually one of them it is, yeah, you need to know something personal about him to solve a password. But in the film, most of the challenges are about symbolically fixing the mistakes that James Halliday made during yeah. his life. What is your focus on and is that the right thing to focus on? Because it's about playing the game. It's about living your life. It's about not losing the love of your life because mm. you were too socially awkward. It's about mm. taking the leap and having a go anyway even though you're scared there's much more of a positive message and there's much more of a message in the film about actually working together which is interesting because this is end of march 2020 we're right in the throes of a global pandemic and we're seeing that actually maybe there's something in this socialism thing because people are having to not out of choice really work together on stuff and collaborate on things even if that means right you're working together means that you stay out of the way to keep these other people safe. So there's a real sense of people pulling together in a large way across the globe at the moment. And so it's really interesting to see capitalist America that is epitomised in this company, IOI. You know, the cruelty of it and the lengths that they're willing to go to to make money out of stuff. Because really their goal is to sell about 80% of the visual landscape of what anybody sees Mm. in the Oasis to advertising. And the Oasis is quite clear of that. 
for the most part, it's not about that. It's about having a place where people can go when the real world doesn't feel like a safe space for them. So this is supposed to be a safe space for people to be able to go and to be entirely themselves and who they want to be. So there's quite a nice message about that. But then it's also, in a way, implicitly making this point that actually you should be able to be yourself in the actual real world. And the real world needs to wind its neck in because it's much too cruel and capitalist driven. And maybe if you have a cooperative and you run something huge that loads of people love as a cooperative, maybe it doesn't need to be a massive profit spinner. It can run off itself. So there's quite a positive message from that, which is quite, in a way, rare. It's weird because it's that Spielbergian Amblin kind of thing. It's a bit like the Goonies, where they all have to work together to solve the puzzle, save the day. Same with E.T., they have to work as a team to achieve their goals. And this is something that reels against capitalist America, while at the same time as being quite afraid of communist Russia and China, for example. There's just something jarring in it, where it's like capitalism's bad but actually capitalism's really awesome you know so there is quite a disconnect there where I think there's just this message of they're trying to say well maybe capitalism isn't that brilliant an idea is there some sort of compromise we can make between capitalism and socialism which Mm. may actually be an appropriate answer to things I don't know there's multiple compromises offered by the two works that we're looking at here because the book says what Artemis wants to do is use the money that you inherit if you win the easter egg to just end End capitalism. Mm. She wants to use it to feed the world. And that is what happens at the end of the book. When Parzival wins, he says, right, that's it. I'm just going to use this money to feed everyone on the planet. In addition, even before he goes into that final challenge, he's also made a deal that's unconditional, which is, I'm going to split this four ways with the three other avatars who have been helping me do this. There's already quite a collectivist mm. thing going on there. And then he essentially just goes, right, I'm going to use this wealth for good when he wins it. In the book, he still just wins all the money alone, but he defends the Oasis from a company that wants to use it for profit. He keeps use of it free. Turns it off two days a week to get people to use the outside world more mm-hmm. profitably. The film's less socialist than the book is, but it still has that, yeah, capitalism is a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> capitalism makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable mm. at, attempt to try to find some sort of alternative mm. to it. And it seems to be a journey that in both Parzival has to take, mostly through his relationship with Artemis. It's very similar. I think it's quite word for word, actually, when they have a conversation about you already are on in their meeting, where she asks, what would you do if you won the prize money and he says oh you know I'll buy a big mansion I'll live a nice life because this is somebody who it's much more pronounced in the book but he is in abject poverty he's in a really terrible way it's interesting because the setting is for Parzival in both he lives in Columbus Ohio and in the film that they stress that Columbus is the fastest growing city in the world do they say somehow yes, so. yeah. I think they've just made that an arbitrary location in the film and somehow everyone happens to be there where in the book it's a bit more realistic in that all of the people he becomes friends with are all spread across the world two of the characters are Japanese they're in Japan Artemis is Canadian she's in Vancouver in British Columbia H is somewhere else across America driving around about, in an RV all the time yeah, yeah and quite mobile and part of all is in Columbus whereas they're all in Columbus for some reason already mm. in yeah. the film the whole time for part of all he He's basically living in the future equivalent of a trailer park. So it's the stacks they're called. So these stacks of old trailers, old caravans built in a high rise structure. So rather than just build what we would call council flats here in the UK and high rises have I think a more sense of grandeur in the US where it's they're quite fancy places to live and that started to come here as well but the original high rise living accommodations were actually council accommodations where it was people who were very poor would be put to live in these really cramped damp little flats so it's basically trailers from a trailer park stacked on top of each other in a higgledy-piggledy way in a sort of scaffolding 
building structure. There's a very rear window-esque sequence at the start of the film that shows you as Wade goes down from the top of his and is travelling down through all of the other ones and everybody's playing the Oasis and are doing all these different things. You're seeing them through their windows and it's quite voyeuristic but they can't see that you're seeing them and they're in this other presence. They're not present in the real world but they're present in this Oasis time and space so they don't even care about what they video kick and there's sequences where a mother is just ignoring her small child because she's in the middle of playing Doom. Yeah it's communicated visually that Parzival is in this kind of poverty but I think in the book it rams at home a bit more that he really doesn't have any money. He is in a really abusive home. He's a bit younger in the book as well. I think the film it seems to start at a later point for Parzival anyway because really he gets himself out of poverty by completing the first task and getting the first key isn't it? And then he immediately gets the first gate. So he becomes this really wealthy celebrity in the Oasis overnight literally because he does this late at night and then first thing the next morning. One day he's this really poor, hard done by high school student and then the next day he is the star of the Oasis and everybody wants a piece of him and he's got this economic mobility now when we meet him in the film he's something between that he's not just the basic avatar as he is in the book for a long time because you know the book is you start out in just jeans and a black t-shirt yeah and you don't have any weapons you don't have anything and it's all a matter of acquiring these things and you can do it through really mundane stuff like killing wolves just doing well get experience points and you rack up stuff you can have battles with non-player characters if Mm. you play a player character and you risk dying you could lose everything so he never does that you know he can't afford to lose anything he's got the vr equipment in the real world because he's Mm. enrolled in this public school system it's the only way he actually has the equipment whereas there's no way to explain how he has anything in the real world in the film i mean he's using quite old stuff There's a slight storyline where he seems to be in the habit of borrowing slash stealing his aunt's higher tech haptic gloves. There's a very difficult scene around domestic abuse when he is confronted by his aunt and her seems to be boyfriend at the time. Yeah, I think more in the film, it's more that this is Hollywood dire straits, (laughs) you know, where you've got a certain level of privilege, whereas in the book, he's really in a bad way. The only way that they imply that he's poor in the film is that when he races in the things, the first contest that you have to do to get the first key in this mass race, he always starts from the back so that he can collect up dropped coins from other players who've crashed. And that's it. We don't have any other indication that he's poor. There is some equivalent of him becoming a celebrity in the book. You get that in the film. The whole time we were watching this last night, I thought there's two quite cinematic things happening here. And the first is, this looks like a Spielberg film. And I don't mean that in terms of composition or types of action or people staring off screen looking wide-eyed. I just mean that all of the shots look slightly wide-angled. 50 millimeter lens is a standard lens, so anything shorter than that starts to make things slightly bulgy in the mm. middle, slightly curvy on the outside, it exaggerates depth. A wide angle lens makes people who are close to the camera look like they've got really big noses. I don't think it's a wide angle lens, but I think it is a short lens. It's kind of halfway between wide angle and standard length. And also, Spielberg loves to use anamorphic lenses. Rather than shooting in 70 millimeter, he'll shoot in anamorphic widescreen. He's squishing a widescreen image onto a standard 35 millimeter film strip anamorphic lenses which cause a certain amount of distortion as well as if there's i mean this is something i need to look into whether anamorphic lenses are just automatically a little bit short anyway and create that distortion because when the camera tilts up in some points you can see that the planes seem to bend as the tilting happens the horizontal lines for example seem to bend it became clear when we had that bit which was set in the overlook hotel Mm. which recreated not just the sets from The Shining but specific footage from Mm. The Shining as well and recreated using the exact same lenses and at least trying to create the effect of using the exact same stock that Kubrick used and then after that when it went back to Spielberg's own style it just looked graphically very different Mm. it had that relatively shallow depth of field and that tendency of lines that are supposed to be straight to bend near the edge of the frame and the tendency of camera movement to make the story space appear to bend 
But that only applied to the world outside the Oasis. The Oasis seems to be shot, in inverted commas, because, you know, it's all computer-generated mm-hmm. reality, seems to be shot with very different virtual lenses. The actors do seem to have done some mocap, though. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Their avatars do take on physical traits of them, and that seems to be how it works with the VR haptic equipment, where, depending on how much gear you have, it can really take on the details of your own physique and face particularly the face Artemis in the film is so different from Artemis in the book because Artemis in the book I mean we find out that she's in Canada we don't know anything about her family or anything they seem to have just thrown in a tiny bit of backstory Mm. to give you an understanding of why the character is motivated to try and win and do what she wants to do she wants to be socialist about the Oasis it gives a reason for that but there's no reason given it's just that that's how this person is in the book. I think Artemis is really underdeveloped in both emotionally. And I think that's just a mark of this is written by dudes who were obsessed with computer games and movies and certain bands in their teenage years in the 1980s. So they have no idea what women are. So I think they don't really understand what a a young woman in her late teens or early 20s would be like. And I think apart from just having the focus levels right, I mean Artemis I think in the film is fairly flirtatious. In the book she really is standoffish with Parzival for a long time and then I mean there's just these leakages of her oversharing and being quite friendly with him but the book builds up more that she is a big deal in the Oasis so she's somebody who is seriously knowledgeable and has been doing this for a lot longer than Parzival. I mean it turns out that she's a tiny bit older than him. She claims to be a college student. She's maybe about 20 at the start and he's 17 or something. It's mentioned he goes oh older woman yeah at one point in a chat she's ahead of him and she's much more knowledgeable and I think they deal with that in a more implicit way in the film where she turns up to the race and he knows who she is and he's a nobody to her and yet he's the one who's sitting in the DeLorean kit hybrid he has that already whereas this is something he has to really build up towards the scene where they're in this zero gravity dance thing she's really flirtatious with him and then when he opens up to her emotionally she just flips the other way and it's quite erratic it seems whereas in the book I don't think it's so erratic because they build up a friendship over a long period of time they both lose focus on what they're supposed to be doing I think there's about six months go by and they haven't got to the next stage yet they haven't got even an idea really of where to start for the second key and they get really distracted with their friendship whereas in the film it just feels like they've known each other a day or something (laughs) (laughs) when he says I love you Mm -hmm. and it's just what you know so understandably in the film she's like you don't have a clue whereas in the book it feels like they've spent a lot of time in this virtual world together and actually it does feel like a relationship and she's rejecting it because it makes her realize I've lost focus I was so focused before and she's quite sore actually that he cracked the first thing before her and I think that works out doesn't it in the same way where she gets the second thing first in both It's different things, but she does crack it first. Yes. In the film, she's quite conscious that they have a job to do, or at least they independently have these jobs to do. They're up against the evil corporation, IOI. In the book, she's just a lot more standoffish, a lot more, okay, no, we we mustn't do this, we mustn't have a relationship essentially the not before the big game approach and in the book it's deferral after deferral after deferral Mm. there's months for which you won't even speak to him and then finally when the final challenge is done then they physically get to meet each other and it's the extra climax at the end of the book Mm. in the film they do have that her being no no we must concentrate on the task at hand they have that but then very soon after she does that you know in real life she's samantha and in real life parzival is wade Wade and Samantha they meet in real life and Samantha shows that she's part of this underground rebellion Mm. and brings her aboard and so the meeting happening right at the end and being the great big reward Mm. that you finally get to have a real world fleshy relationship after you do all the virtual stuff that isn't there it doesn't apply they're beginning to have a real world fleshy relationship Mm -hmm. about halfway through the film Mm. and it's only postponed by her getting captured by IOI Mm. yeah Yeah. and that totally flips doesn't it what happens in the book 
The whole thing about Sorrento trying to first offer Wade a lot of money in exchange for his knowledge and then that doesn't work and it ends up escalating. This is a company that's so capitalist it's willing to kill to achieve its goals. So he threatens to write, I know your location, I'm gonna blow you up. But they've got his exact location wrong. He's not actually in his aunt's caravan in the stack. He's a bit further away because he's found this pile of abandoned crushed up cars and he's found a van inside and that's basically where his little hideout is. In the film it's the same sort of thing isn't it in the book where he has this secret place he goes to. Yeah it's exactly the same. There's a huge pile of crushed up cars near the stacks that he uses. There's a van inside and he uses that to broadcast. So the same thing happens essentially where it happens much quicker in the film and actually Wade is absolved of any responsibility in the film. Yeah. Version he's just a victim whereas in the book he calls Sorrento's bluff and it goes horribly wrong and it ends up killing his aunt and everybody who was in that whole stack of caravans. It's a bit more like... I suppose the way migrant workers and refugees are crammed into small houses, it's just loads of poor people piled into these big caravans. There's a whole stack of these, a whole high rise of these just is blown up and it's blamed on you know meth labs and stuff mm. as if these people have been making drugs and then it's just written off as well they're low lives they're this underclass who just make drugs all the time and so they deserve to die and nobody cares it's masked as something like that whereas that's not as obvious i think in the film yes that there's that excuse yeah so many of these tiny details are just set aside in the film and, yeah and the film still hangs together yeah yeah but there's a lot of hang on what did that person just say what's clanning what's the new Apologist. Yeah. And you do have to go back and listen to moments when someone explains it or implies what it means. There's none of that. That entire plot segment makes no sense unless you know something about the book mm. that you can often do with films. The film is very good at making an impression of something and it's just now having read the book we've got a fuller picture and you can see what's missing from the film that yeah. is fleshed out in. I would say maybe a bit too much detail in the book because it's very wordy. It's it such a detail. It goes on. Yeah. It's quite Drony. I mean the detail is in a way quite academic it's geeky in the most ultimate sense there's too much it's overwhelming the amount of detail sometimes and it is part of the characterization because it's told in first person it's told by Wade from an unspecified point in the future of the story yeah and Wade being the ultimate nerd is going to be really nerdy when telling his own story true so but at the same time if you'd been through this massive exhausting experience could you really be bothered skip to the end type mm. thing you know just a little space draft there because Simon Pegg is in the film. So Sorrento has the stack blown up and Wade of course is not there, he survives. But Wade in the book goes into hiding for six months. He's economically able to do this now. He manages to travel to another city under the radar, has a flat and he just stays inside this flat for six months and it's quite interesting going through that just as we were going into the lockdown because he does this to himself yeah. for about six months. He does not leave this apartment at it all did, it for seem, six months. It seemed appropriate. Yeah, because yeah. he just has food delivered to him. He has everything he needs. He's earning loads of money at this point in the inside the Oasis because he's got all these advertising deals for stuff. Yeah. He's doing lots of product placement and that sort of thing. So he's earning enough to pay for everything in the real world from his Oasis account. And so he's able to survive like that eventually they find him don't they and he lets them take him yeah he deliberately fakes his own accounts to make it look like he's in quite a lot of debt and he's under a fake identity at that point mm. and a lot of debt to ioi innovative online industries to get himself captured by them and made into an indentured servant effectively a slave so that he can hack their systems from the inside and there's none of that for him in the film. That's no. That's entirely given to... That's given over uh, to Artemis, who yeah. is captured by them yeah, so and the, taken in. That scathing indictment of capitalism, the indenturement bit in the book, is not replicated in the film. Mm. And thinking of things in the book that aren't replicated in the film, that criticism of being indoors... I mean, that criticism of being indoors is really quite strong mm. in the book. It's, yeah. That criticism says, OK, these people do, by really committing themselves to hunting for the 
geese and the egg in the oasis, they do ultimately stop the evil mega corporation from taking over the oasis. So that's a good thing. But they really pay a price in that they become these hermits. Mm -hmm. They lose knowledge of everything that really matters. They become utterly alienated from the outside world. They become unable to function in the outside world. They become these quite pitiful characters. And therefore, at the end, in the last few um, lines of the book, where Wade says, I've been spending this time outside and I realised that I hadn't for 15 minutes wanted to be in the oasis. Mm. I hadn't missed the oasis. That really means something in the book. In the film, there is a bit of a thing at the end about how you really need to get out in reality more because reality is the only real thing. But there's none of that. It's really quite a horrible thing to be immersed in the oasis. It does quite horrible things to your psyche and to your body. The film's actually really quite enthusiastic about mm. virtual environments. This is something which we should expect to see quite a lot in films which have substantial computer-generated mm. segments. You notice this in Avatar as well. That both of these films go, it's really great to get out of your virtual self and get into your real world self and really interact with real people but actually the virtual self's really cool mm. isn't it so let's just not really make that criticism of the virtual self or let's make it and then take it back in some way and so in this it ends with yeah and we arranged that the oasis would be turned off on tuesdays and thursdays so there is a compromise there but the film is still utterly enthusiastic about mm. having a virtual self at the end of the book it's basically i think we all have just outgrown this there's a real difference there about how enthusiastic these two versions of the story are about one's avatar, about living in a virtual environment. This book and this film, they differ in several regards in just how complex the plot is. They differ in their attitude towards the virtual reality environment. But they are uniform in the autonomy that is given to female characters. They are uniform in the general sense of nostalgia that they feel. That's one thing that the book doesn't undercut. Although I suppose... Is there an implicit criticism in both of these films of how Halliday's own likes have taken over from people's actual yeah. popular culture activities? Well, this is a real problem. Everybody gets into what he was into and it doesn't seem to matter a damn about quality, about are you actually interested in this for yourself or are you just like it because this guy who created this environment liked it? And let's be clear for our listeners that the reason why the hunters for the egg in the Oasis get into what Halliday was into is because if you do that you'll both be more likely to solve his clues and more able to play the challenges that he'll have set up within these gates that are hidden in the oasis. And I mean even IOI it's fueled by these holiday scholars so all these people who are experts in his mm. whole life and so this is an incredibly introverted person who has made it so that so many people have to know every inch of his life. Yeah. It's really quite bizarre, actually. It's Revenge of the Nerd. And he's played by Mark Rylance doing his best Garth from Wayne's World impression. He's really socially awkward. He's really internal, really introverted. He's basically Bill Gates in this. He's this person who's created all of this tech, this whole world that he's built. And just because people love being in it, that's why they want to own it. They want to be Halliday. So that's why their lives are taken over by this other person's psyche and knowledge. At no point are you sure. Does Wade actually like that film though? You know, is Artemis really into that stuff? I can't remember who directed it. The Young Victoria. It's Emily Blunt, isn't it, who plays the young Queen Victoria. There's a bit in it where she meets Albert for the first time and he's been sent over specifically to woo her. I mean, they're cousins already, but, you know, he's been sent over. OK, this is going to happen. When they sit down and they're talking with each other, she's asking him, so what's your favourite composition? What's your favourite novel? And his answer to these questions is he's been told to just say that his favourite mm. stuff is exactly what her favourite stuff is. And she senses immediately what's going on. Mm. He's saying that my favourite novel is actually this Walter Scott novel, my favourite composers, actually, blah, blah. And then she says, really? Is it? And he goes, actually, no, I prefer Schubert. He's just real with her for a moment. He goes, no, I'm not actually into the things that you're into. And then they start a relationship. Now, of course, that's a complete contrivance, but that's what's missing from Ready Player One, isn't it? Yeah. It's just anyone going, I differ in my popular culture tastes. I think that's why the characters seem to lack a bit of depth. 
you never get to know who any of them really are even when mm. you see their real world selves they don't have personalities their whole life is solving these puzzles and that is taken up by knowing all this stuff about Halliday it's obsessive to quite an extreme point we've both done PhDs so we know what it's like to be obsessive about a specific topic for years of your life and this seems to go beyond that this is major geekery but to a point where they actually aren't living their lives anymore more and you have to wonder well maybe a corporation like IOI it's okay for them to take over this thing because then none of you have to think about it you just go in and play the games and then live your lives it's made out that IOI which you know maybe we mentioned it the first time round it's of course looks like 101 and it's a bit in 1984 you know there's something very controlling very big brother very surveillancey about IOI but there's something like that about the whole oasis it's much more prominent in the book that Wade is a obsessed about Artemis almost as much as he is about Halliday. He's read everything she's ever done. He knows everything about her Oasis profile before she blogs, they meet. She live streams. She's basically a YouTuber who he's a fanboy of. Mm-hmm. And I suppose that's, in the book, that's one way of breaking out of the Halliday cage. And it's that other people are creating their own cultural artefact in the Oasis. And the Oasis is full of a lot of stuff that people have built independently of when Halliday first built it. Mm. Her just live streaming is an element of that. It's, she's just sticking stuff on her channel. So maybe there's a little bit of that resistance in the book. In the film, there's none of that. The thing that comes to mind is that there are elements in the film of popular culture that are not the popular culture that the Halliday of the book was mm-hmm. into. So in the second challenge in the film, and we're just coming to it now on this rewatching of it mm-hmm. that we're doing, they have to go into The Shining. And it's not a reenactment of The Shining, they just go into the Overlook Hotel as it was during the time of The Shining. Whereas in the book, they have to go into environments that are copied from Blade Runner in order to get access to the Jade Gate. Clearly this is because they couldn't get the rights to do stuff from Blade Runner in the film. So yeah, there's just a differing from what the holiday of the book mm-hmm. would have been into. I mean, I um, think that's a bigger point than I wanted to bring up earlier as well anyway, is that it's probably a question of the rights they could get is what determines what is actually in the film. Because yeah. so much of it is different. There's so many film stages we wouldn't have been able to get the rights to. There's quite a few instances of Spielberg saying at the press junkets, I didn't include the Spielberg reference that were in the book in the film I didn't include quite so many I'm trying not to use metaphors that refer to changing the book you know the copy of the book that I made I didn't have all the Spielberg references in it and yet not only do we have Spielberg putting in a load of references to his mate Robert Zemeckis Mm. including films that he produced there's no great overwhelming amount of Spielbergisms in the book there's not really no not a lot there's maybe just the odd mention of Jaws or Close Encounters or something like that it's just maybe passing references. It is films like War Games or Blade Runner. There's no Kubrick at all mentioned in the book. And yet yeah. Shining is a big feature in the film. And it's because Stanley Kubrick was a friend of Steven Spielberg. There's a kind of friend-off happening in here. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose maybe Spielberg thought, I'm playing tribute to lots of my friends. Yeah. So that feels a little bit like not putting my own work into this. So I'll say at the press junkets yeah. that I took a lot of Spielbergisms out of the it's book. Important as well that a lot of the film references are actually in the music. It's an Alan Silvestri score. Obviously there's Back to the Future in there at certain points. Not just when the DeLorean is on screen, but there are moments when it feels... That was a bit like when Biff got punched that time. There are moments when there are just these inflections, little riffs from his own earlier soundtracks that he's done for all of this school of filmmakers but elements of the um, soundtrack from The Shining is referenced in The Shining parts that doom 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 thing it's probably worth mentioning as well because I was trying to get onto this earlier where the differences as well between some of the less prominent characters but they're part of the high five so the original five 
players who first achieve the first key because these include in the book it's Daito and Shoto who are both Japanese and in the film that is changed to Daito and Sho so Daito I think is Japanese American yeah. and Sho is Chinese American and 11 years old so they're both changed quite a bit because it's quite dark actually in the book where one of the big plot points is that Daito's avatar disappears at one point in a massive battle but it turns out that Daito's player, that person, is killed yeah. by a faction of IOI in Japan. He was saying there's this social problem of these people becoming hermits and so the character who's behind the avatar of Daito, because there's this spate of people who play it so much and they become hermits and they become so socially disengaged that maybe they're suffering with really great depressions and they're all living in high rises. People get so in despair that they throw themselves off their balconies and things. And this is forced onto Daito where he's stormed by IOI and the guy is thrown out of his apartment and he's, you know, on the 43rd floor or something crazy like that. They're actually a very murderous bunch much earlier on in the book and we'll go to these things but make it look like a suicide in a similar way to them making it look like a drugs making accident in the stacks and it's interesting where Shoto and Daito play as if they're brothers in the book but they're not really a pair in the same way in the film no, they seem to be paired up, but their names in the book refer to a weapon. If you put them together, they refer to a certain sort of Japanese mm. weapon, and so that's this real clear indication that they're brothers. So when Wade Strike Parzival finds out in the real world that they're not actually brothers, they're just really good friends, that's yeah. a bit of a shock. Whereas in this, they're just a pair who work together, and then it turns out in real life that one of them's roughly the same age as the other players, and then one of them's a little kid. It's one of those changes that I think might have been made in terms of cultural sensitivity. Maybe somebody researched what the word Shoto actually means and it doesn't mean what Ernest Klein thought that it meant and so they went okay let's mm. change one of these characters to something else. They're included in the high five bunch but I don't think they're as prominent in the film no, no. as they are in the book. I mean, even in the book, they're very surfacey and it's very, hello, Parzival san You know, it's all very <laughs> yeah. stereotypical Japanese stuff. And they seem to be in there to be Japanese humans who are also as into Japanese films as Halliday was. Yeah. Just to smooth over the cultural tourism that's being described in the novel. Because Halliday was into Japanese monster movies in particular, therefore they feature in the space of the Oasis and therefore they're going to be part of these challenges, so it seems useful to have a couple of Japanese characters go, oh yes, we recognise that it is worthy that someone mm. likes these films. So we've been talking about differences between characterization between the book and the film, but one thing that is consistent, and I've paused it here, on this moment where Artemis is about to dance with the non-player character version of Kira that's in the Oasis, they're not actually about to dance. At least she says something like, may I have this dance? And then she just instantly wins, so there's no actual dancing going on. So she pretends to be Halliday does the thing that she's aware Halliday never did in real life and then that moment instantly gets the jade key and because she gets given it by Anorak the Almighty Halliday's own avatar even though Halliday's dead she does talk to Anorak as if he's Halliday and says something like she was very beautiful she tries to have a bit of a personal connection with him and then he talks over her because mm. he's saying right that's it on with the game yeah. don't want to talk about it it's quite ambiguous mm. with Halliday though in the film because in the book he's dead He's totally, totally, definitely, definitely <laughs> dead. In yeah. the film, there's a little bit of a question mark over, is he actually dead, though? You know, Parzival at the end is going through all the his induction ceremony, I guess, with Halliday, because Anorak, his avatar, has changed into Halliday properly. And there's also the boy version of Halliday. They both go to leave. And, you know, he says, you're dead, aren't you? Because yeah. he's in his human form. And he doesn't say anything he just leaves he just closes the door there is more of a clearer sense of I needed to pass this on to somebody who would do the right thing with it it's more of a test to see if the person was going to be honourable that he was passing it on to actually on that in the book three people have to enter the final challenge at the Together. same time that's a big thing is that it's set up so that the prize isn't going to be won 
one by one person. It's probably going to be one by three people. And so there's an element of Halliday going, I want this yeah. to be passed on to a collective. We get versions of that in the film, but not exactly the same setup of three people have to enter at the same time. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that in the book prevents three people entering at the same time is a bit of last minute shady dealings by mm-hmm. IOI. And so that's why it's Parzival who's the one who technically wins it. But in the book, Klein has Parzival go, I'm sharing this with all the other three mm-hmm. surviving members of the High Five. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to point out is that there's no overt mention in the film that H is real life human, who is called Helen Harris. Yeah. That she's gay. It's overtly mentioned in mm-hmm. the in the book. She and Wade, they talk about it when they finally meet. Yeah. So that's a thing. She's black as well, and she talks about how having an avatar in a world where the default body is male and white is something that is very useful for people who are neither of these things. But it was also a refuge for somebody who'd been kicked out of her own house for yeah. being gay. Now, in the film, there's none of that mentioned. No. But during the sequence where they're all in the Shining set, and H has never seen the Shining, so mm-hmm. H doesn't know what's going to happen so H ends up in room 237 yeah. and sees this woman getting out of the bar <laughs> and H goes oh okay I'll leave you alone it's fine okay and then the woman walks up to him and he he because the avatar's male goes oh okay right I'll just go with it then and mm-hmm. leans in for a kiss and then later on of course we find out that H's real life human is a woman so that's the tiniest yeah, little implication just that really this, the avatar's real life human is gay that's about all we're going to get in a Spielberg film there is a lot of underdevelopment there I would say that is another example of where the character is a good bit more developed in the book but the book has space to do that in between the big lengthy geek nerdery stuff but even in the book it feels surfacy. you would like to think that by 20 2054 whatever year this is that we wouldn't be there anymore that you wouldn't have the young people being kicked out by their parents in the developed western world and race wouldn't be so much of an issue maybe that doesn't bode well for what we think of our future but I'd really like to hope those things are not okay anymore by then that people can just be who they are and not have to come out and not have to worry about what is in their pants I mean in a way there's a very implicit trans thing going on but it's very binary do you know it's very much right I am a gay woman in this life I am a male with a whitish physique in that life I feel like we did get into that a bit and I think we got into the you because I think it is quite an ableist film as well and I think we talked a bit about that last time. It always stresses me out when characters are, I mean clearly they're on a low loader and they're not actually driving or they're on a one of those yeah. back screen things but they're just looking well away from the road while they're supposed to be driving and that really stresses me out. But yeah, H is very underdeveloped I think and especially because Helen and Wade as their avatars, they have such a deep friendship they have a sort of bromancy friendship there's a conversation between Artemis and Parzival in a book that's transferred to H and Parzival that thing about well you don't know who anybody is I could be a 40 year old guy called Chuck who lives in his mum's basement and in the book mm. it's Artemis is trying to put Parzival off being interested in her and also she's very self conscious about the birthmark over half of her face which is quite subtle in the film whereas H says that to Parzival worrying about well you can't trust Artemis you don't know who this person is you because know, she sees her friend falling in love with this avatar but she herself is an avatar who has not been honest but then it's an avatar do you have to be honest you know, cause there's a big mm. deal of that made in the book where they finally do meet and they have to spend because there's this big convoluted thing where Ogden is helping them helps them in the film as well but in a very different way Ogden helps them as well in the book by Mm. getting them all together because they're all spread out across the place Ogden is rich enough to charter private jets and fly people from Canada from Japan but instructs H to pick Parzival up so Helen has to go and pick Wade up 
wherever he is at that point because he's not in Columbus anymore I don't think and get to an airport to then go on a flight so they have this really quite long awkward journey with each other they have a bro trip yeah where we had has to encounter right this person who had this big white male avatar is a black woman and it's one of those where race isn't mentioned when it comes to the white people but race is mentioned when it comes to Japanese or African-American people and you think well again this is a book set in the future are we still going to be doing that in the 2050s? Really? It's one of the elements of the film that says, hey, the Oasis is great, because it says, hey, look, it's something like the late 2040s. It's well over 30 years into the future, yet we've still got all these social problems. Maybe the only way we're going to solve these is through virtual reality. It's just not... Where you can be a yeah. sexy cat lady without yeah. <laughs> judgment. It's not permitting other people's tendencies to think certain things about certain people to even activate by keeping it secret from them what a person's personal characteristics are. One of the many elements in the film that goes, yeah, the Oasis is actually amazing, which of course is what's going to happen when you're trying to sell computer-generated cinema. The Oasis is a stand-in for computer-generated cinema, then no matter how critical Mm. the book you're adapting is of the Oasis, the film's going to be really quite enthusiastic about it. It's an odd thing as well, where the Oasis in the book, and presumably in the film as well, as your avatar in the Oasis, you can watch whole movies. Yes. And so you have to wonder about what's going on there with copyright and pay. Do the Oasis buy stuff? And then it's mm. accessible for free for one. Because mm. this is the thing, is part of all Wade is a really poor kid, yet has, by the age of, what, 17, I think he is when we first meet him in the book, he's seen all of these films that Halliday was really into in his life. He somehow had time to watch those and the whole of Family Ties, do you know, like whole massive long-running American TV series and yeah. Japanese and anime tv series and to put hundreds of hours of gameplay into a lot of classic computer games yeah and also to watch monty Python and the holy grail in excess of 150 times yeah such that he knows it off by heart and somehow go to school (laughs) you know he's got so much time to do all of these things in the book version in a way it's explainable in a film because it doesn't seem like he does anything else it just shows you he gets up in the morning he goes to his little van he's in the oasis for however many hours and no one ever seems to eat anything at least in the book you know there's toilet breaks and there's food breaks and stuff very rarely but at least they do get acknowledged that they need to happen but there's none of that in the film nobody needs to go to the toilet nobody needs to eat anything that's the difference between prose fiction and film fiction is that in prose fiction people ingest and egest I was just thinking about the version where Artemis gets indentured, shall we say. The film is quite ambiguous about this, whereas I think the book has a bit more clarity, where there seems to be a class of, say, employees working at IOI who are indentured and they're doing really menial manual jobs within the Oasis. And then there are more security type ones and the gamer ones. And then there's the scholarly ones. It's unclear to what extent any of these people are there because they want to be. It seems like it's presented to people as this is a really secure workplace. So the scholars seem to be there because they really love having this knowledge, they love sharing it, they feel maybe they're putting it to good use. It seems certainly in the climactic scenes there's a pale-skinned, red-haired young woman who's one of the scholars who is feeding them the information. She's working it out and she's leading them all really enjoying watching Parsifal, managing to play adventure to get the Easter egg. She works it out as well. And there's a parallel between her and Artemis because Artemis slash Samantha in the book have black hair and she's red-headed in the film, which is quite a nerdy thing. There's nothing at all to indicate this other than just utter nerdery but there's a bit of a Dana Scully thing for me going on there in the Mm. just pale skin red hair more of an Irish complexion 
that's the extent of it. I mean, there's no other kind of reference <laughs> that it could possibly be. There's that connection between Artemis and this anonymous, unnamed scholar. So there's all these little pods where all these indentured people go and they seem to be doing the manual work. So it's not really clear to what extent are the more security level ones. Are they also indentured? Are they there because they enjoy doing that job? Are they there because they had no other choice and it was a job and this is a really difficult economic environment? I think the book again it's clear that there's been a massive global energy crisis where all the fossil fuels have run out and yet yeah. they use energy for everything there's nothing that's paired back to working the land everything is electronic and digital in the book it's mentioned that the main source of energy is wind there are these vast wind farms in between cities no mention of that in the film nothing where, yeah, where any of this yeah. power comes from all the fossil fuels have gone and where's the power coming from all concentrated in Columbus Ohio as well in the film there's just yeah. no sense of a wider world beyond this one sprawling city it's just anamorphic lens focus rack mm. slight distortion it's happening again and again you'll not be able to not notice it from now on mm. in most of Spielberg's films we've been watching it silently while discussing it and we are now an hour and a half into this film and it's working up to the final climax I do wonder though in films when you see a character that's in a film that's not in the book that character has usually been inserted because one of the screenwriters had a really big problem they needed to solve if you're going to create a new character that's usually because of the amount of screen time that's going to take up that's usually you paying quite a big price for bringing some sort of benefit to the work because the norm is taking characters out just stripping stuff out take that out take that plot event out take that entire subplot out strip out that entire family just take it all out and then we'll get it into 100 minutes but creating a new character and I'm talking about the character that you've mentioned which is the oologist who is the more insightful than the other ones mm. the one with the red hair one of the reasons she seems to have been put in is to point out that the Halliday scholars on the IOI staff that they're just as well-meaning as mm. the egg hunters are there's very few people in IOI who are actually antagonists it's mm. mainly just Sorrento as if he's the one antagonist in this there's just one villain she's also given a little tiny romance plot as well because mm. she seems to quite like the head mm. of the urologist team the beady guy and so in that final moment where everyone's chapping and clearing because Parzival's got the egg she grabs him and hugs him I think and maybe even kisses him too it's an interesting moment of, okay we'll just have this one extra character we'll have to have a bit of dialogue we just need to have somebody s you know this is it isn't it is to have somebody say what in the book is communicated by Wade pointing it out as his narrator of his own story of course you can have Wade say stuff and imply it by his actions in the film but you can't have him say and imply absolutely everything that is relevant even to the plot events that they keep mm. in the film and so she's just there to be the voice of ah no the whole point of playing adventure in the final challenge in Castle Anorak is not winning the game it's to find the easter mm. egg in the game this is a homage to easter eggs they just probably couldn't figure out any way of having that fact articulated mm. so gotta have a character say it do any of our current characters qualify to say that no, fine, we'll have to invent a new character. It is one of the worst things to do when you write screenplays, go, okay, I need to have a character say this. And just not thinking through who you're going to give that line of dialogue mm. to. Because you can just have characters saying things to each other which everyone already knows. So there's no motive for character A to even say it to character B. Or you can have people saying things to people who should already know it. Someone who shouldn't know it can be saying it to someone who should already know it. It can be completely backwards. This film, the screenwriters mm. were brave enough to just write in a new character to go, yeah. right, fine, yeah. We can't have one of the existing characters say that without compromising the integrity of the film. So we'll create a new character. Something you had pointed out as well is it's not explicitly clear why in the film the IOI avatars are called Sixers. No. I think you can work it out because Ewan Artemis joins their war floor yeah. and she gets into one of these arbitrary suits. She becomes a Sixer avatar, you know, and it has six digits. They just have these six digit numbers as um, their name. They're on their visors, aren't they? It says IOI dash and there's a six digit number. I think in the book the six digit number begins with six but in the film the six digit number ends with six but it's just not stated in the film mm. it's one of those details which probably should have been in the line of narration somewhere and also there's bits in this when Wade narrates his own story mm. but it seems to follow the standard rule of you can have narrators in film but you can only have them during the first minute and during mm -hmm. the last minute as well mm -hmm. apart yeah, from that yeah, yeah. you can't have either a character or an omniscient narrator pop in and go I'm just going to tell you a mm. thing it feels a bit wrong 
This dude who plays adventure and yeah. wins it, he's the unsung hero of this film. He fails because you're not supposed to play adventure and win it. You're supposed to play adventure and do the Easter egg. Yeah, but it's really but, nice. Yeah. There's a really lovely close-up of him being told, play adventure, and he smiles because he's like, I've got this, lads. <laughs> I love this game. This yeah. is my jam. I'm playing you know? it again, yeah. And it's just this background actor, this guy with no lines, <laughs> just, just has this brilliant moment in a Spielberg film of... <laughs> you know and it's so class you know like he's yeah. really happy about this and he's even they have him holding his hands up right up close to his yeah, face yeah like he's, he's going, really oh, into <laughs> playing the game and when Anorak the Almighty turns up to give people the key he usually says something like thank you for playing my game he definitely says it in the mm-hmm. third one where he gives the egg to Parzival is thank you for playing my game and that's the sincere message mm-hmm. behind this is I had a thing for you to do I hope you enjoyed it it's gratifying to me to know that I created something mm-hmm. Mm. would likely to give you enjoyment. It's interesting that Artemis looks like Artemis when she's a sixer. Yes. Whereas in the book, they all just have a uniform look. They have that, just literally a uniform, but they seem to have some sort of facial definition in the film, whereas yeah. there's none of that in the book. Because I think you need special tech for it to map out your facial features, which mm. Artemis in the book seems to have in her home rig, but it probably shouldn't be picked picking her up in the way that it is in an IOI one but of course that's how we know that it's her because a number isn't enough because you're not going to pay attention to those details when there's an epic battle of too (laughs) many things to keep track of there's just this massive visual field of all these things but there's going to be references within that isn't there you know there's going to be characters we've missed if we pause it right now I'm sure we'll see a detail somewhere from some film that yeah. we've seen or some game that we've played because even those big IOI things are what are those things in Star Wars called you the big walking things they're called Atat walkers right so they're a bit like those they're not the same shape but mm. it's the same idea isn't it yeah so it's IOI mm. versions of those things and Parzival's back in Estelorian and again this is something that he works up towards and it he keeps it in a tiny cube in his pocket so that's in the book but you actually get to the point of how he gets that, how he's able to purchase that as a thing. Mm. Some of the real world action in this film, I did mention this when we rewatched it last night. Uh-huh. There's a bit where the. Did you catch her name? The one who we're following right oh, now, the IOI employee, sure, whose actually. job it is to chase down the, the high five. She plays quite a classic role, which is the head of security, the trusted lieutenant of mm. IOI. And it's her job to do real world dirty work. And she's chasing down Wade. Helen, Sho and Dito in this van as they're driving through the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio. While they're logged into the Oasis and also doing fighting, so they're doing kind of two sorts of fighting at the same time, the violence that's going on in the Oasis gets duplicated Mm. in this real world fight. Mm -hmm. In fact, to quite an extreme extent, because they Mm. kick her out of the van and she falls on her back and does a kind of head over heels thing. And my thought was, oh, she's dead. You can't go through that and survive. But yeah, she does. She just turns up at the end of the film with a a slight scratch on Mm. her face. And of course, because she's the trusted lieutenant, she realises she's on the wrong side and punches Sorrento in the face Mm. in the last shot. So even though she's in the same police car as him and they've been arrested, she punches him in the face. I just realised, we just saw an epic dolly zoom. I think not the inventor of the dolly zoom, but someone who used it very conspicuously in, in one of his films has just gone, hey, I can do a dolly zoom. Of course, it's a kind of uber dolly zoom. Th- those were the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> it's an uber dolly zoom because it's digitally done. During the big battle outside of Castle Anorak, the Sixers up against the Gunters, we have this helicopter shot that goes straight in mm. to Sorrento and part way through the shot, it zooms into him. Mm-hmm. So when we see Sorrento, this bit of the shot starts long way away zoomed in that means we're going to have a dolly in and zoom out that version of dolly zoom so here we go and the background Mm. collapses away from him but it collapses away more than you can ever make something collapse Mm -hmm. away just using a standard real world lens and dolly Mm -hmm. this dolly is a dolly where the camera moves from a point which is about a kilometer away from him to about two meters in front Mm -hmm. of him in less than two seconds Mm -hmm. while at the same time zooming out i think Mm -hmm. this is very quietly this is spielberg going hey, look what I can do with digital technologies. I can replicate this thing which is specific Mm. to filmmaking which involves lenses. And this is filmmaking that doesn't involve lenses. You don't have to have light pass through the aperture of a a camera. And this is one where instructions will have been given to the visual effects 
people, a massive mm. team of visual effects people, mm. and maybe a lot of them are game programmers as well. I would say mm. that would be a huge amount of what's going on there. There's probably a lot of people who do both. Because I know that when they finished all the principal photography, that was when Spielberg went and made the post while yes. all the visual effects were being <laughs> done. And he didn't have to physically be there for it. He went and made this other smaller film. It is quite common for directors to take overall control of what happens during the huge visual effects stage of filmmaking that. J.J. Abrams, he's big on lens flare and he's big on going, hey, visual effects artists, I need you to simulate lens flare in these shots that we're doing where there's no mm -hmm. lenses involved because I want people to think that they are in the presence of these sci-fi objects. And the way to do that is to show them artifacts of using a camera. Mm. So show us the gook that's on the lens, mm. show us lens flare, show us optical distortions, show us shallow depth of field, focus rack. Mm -hmm. These things which you do not have to have to have when you computer generating your entire shot. He'll say, put them in, make it so that everything has a uniform look because I will do these in my shots where mm. it's not computer generated. And so Spielberg's doing the same thing here. He's going, I want you to add these Spielbergisms. Although I did point out that he's not giving the shots in the Oasis that same anamorphic widescreen distortion look that he puts in his films. Maybe he didn't want it to be that Spielberg-esque. <laughs> Maybe when he was saying, I had to take these Spielbergisms out. Maybe that's what he meant. He mm -hmm. meant just, I didn't duplicate the Spielbergisms in the cinematography of the Oasis mm -hmm. shots. But that's just speculation. I didn't notice this. Artemis, her avatar, has the same birthmark yeah. over her eye as her real person does. Oh, and she's a sixer. It's yeah. not there before. I wonder why. I don't know if she has a choice over that, or it just reproduces you as you are, and you that can't mask anything. That must be it, yeah. She masks it when she's playing her usual avatar. They all have this almost scale-like texture to their, yes. uh, their avatar skins and they can choose these different, they're almost like tattoo designs. So they're not plain skinned. I think we mentioned this when we chatted before. It's like because there's a lot of big robots in the book and there's very few in <laughs> the film. Fewer big robots. Possibly those. what could they get the rights to use. So H has been building out Iron Giant yeah. and then uses Iron Giant as her avatar rather mm. than her H avatar in the final battle and Daito uses the Gundam, Gundam. Um, yeah oh um yeah but it's, it's something else there in the book it's yeah. something else in the book but it's one of these where it turns you into this giant robot for three minutes or something yeah. and it's less brutal in the film because in the book it kills you if you don't abort in time whereas mm. you just go back to your normal self after three minutes it's seems in the film version of it but Daito has this honourable death of his avatar in a similar way mm. to he does in the film mm. I mean it's different but it's similar thing happens where it, he's been the big version of himself that leads to his death but so, the yeah. real Daito mm. isn't dead in this one the screenwriting for this did involve going okay there's this stuff we can't do or it would just be too expensive mm. to do or so on or it would take too long in the film but we can get an equivalent of it in there somehow how. The thing with him playing the perfect game of Pac-Man, that's a good example I suppose. Mm. In, in the book, he plays the perfect game of Pac-Man on the planet Arcade, spelled A-R-C-H-A-I-D. By doing so, he gets this coin that was sitting mm -hmm. on the arcade mm -hmm. game that was stuck there when he first came and he couldn't pick it up. It becomes loose when he plays the perfect game of Pac-Man and he puts it in his inventory and he's not clear what it is. He can't take it out and look at it, it's just stuck there. And then it turns out to be an extra life when his mm. avatar is killed in the very last battle. He gets the same coin with the same function in the film, but he gets it by winning this very casually made bet with the curator, who turns out to actually be Ogden Morrow. I'm sure I've seen her before. There'll be a lot of British actors playing Americans in it because, because it's filmed in the UK. Yeah, it seems to be filmed mostly in Birmingham. Mm. And of course British actors are the only ones who can play Americans properly. <laughs> three of the main adult protagonists in this are not played by Americans because mm. Halliday, played by Mark Rylance, mm -hmm. Morrow, played by Simon Pegg, Pegg, and Nolan Sorrento. Ben Mendelsohn, is he Antipodean? Or... He's Australian. And um, Artemis, she's British. Is it Ooh. Emily Cook or maybe Olivia Cook? Cook? Olivia Cook, sorry. I'm so terrible mm. with names. She's been in films since about 2014. I only looked up all the names last night, but I've forgotten them all already. But I think the one who was playing the lieutenant character, the IOI bounty hunter type one, I think she's been in Game of Thrones and stuff like that. She's British, I'm pretty sure too. But it's not a hugely famous cast. 
No. You certainly know the young ones are not massive names or anything. You know, I think they're certainly all jobbing actors. They're all prolific, but there's no massive star. We're about to get one of my favourite moments in the entire film, and it's because of two shots. Irox sprinting to get away <laughs> before the cataclysm kills him. He's trying to get into a teleport gate, and just at the last minute, he gets killed. And there's this huge mound of stuff that comes out as of swords Ten and years guns. Worth and... Of of, of shit, as he puts it, yeah. But then it just kills everyone, and that's a bit of a dick move. But then it kills Sorrento, too, who set it off. And then he comes out of his chair. His haptic suit is still glowing from mm. where he was just kicked in the crotch. <laughs> and the, the way that Ben Mendelsohn... Uh. Yeah, the way that he walks <laughs> with this thing, he quickly dislodges the crotch part of his yeah. suit. There's the usual Spielberg thing of there are moments of comedy in yeah. this. Action comedy is still the trademark Spielberg generation genre mm. mixture. Anyway, I think that our comprehensive survey of this film <laughs> at 1 hour 15 minutes and 55 seconds is comprehensively comprehended. Yeah, I think that's enough nerdery. Mm. I think that's properly put this one to bed now. Although I have no doubt there will be some sort of publication in the future for you on this. I got my royalty statement today from my Back to the Future All book right. that Bob, sure. Bob and I published. 118 copies in the last year. Wow. That's not bad. I got my royalty statement for a book I wrote in 2012. A couple of days ago as well. This seems to be royalty time. Um, I the economic year. This was for a book called The Cinema and the Origins of Literary Modernism. And for that, I sold four copies <laughs> in the same time period. So that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. BFI Film Classic, 112. Academic book with Routledge, four. At least you've got that many sales of anything. A lot of us can only dream of such dizzy heights as four. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair, and Andrew Scheel. This episode was recorded and edited by Paula Blair, and the music is Common Ground by Airtone licensed under a Creative Commons 3.0 non commercial attribution and can be downloaded from ccmixer.org. Episodes are released every other Wednesday, with the most recent accessible on most podcast apps. We can't currently pay for hosting, but all past episodes can be found on YouTube or links on audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com. If you can help with costs, donations are very welcome at liberapay.com forward slash PEA Blair or paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair. Be part of the conversation with AV Cultures Pod on Instagram or AV Cultures on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. Keep well, be excellent and catch you next time.